Maybe I should turn the microphone on next time. That would probably be a good idea, wouldn't it? Give me one second. I have forgotten to turn on our sweet, sweet ambient. Yeah. I hope that it's not too loud, but it's probably too loud. That's okay. Just reduce the volume a little. Easy peasy. Move <laughs> you over here. There we go. Okay, what the heck did I all miss while I was gone? Hopefully my internet is a little bit stable. It was being a little bit wacky just just a few seconds ago, and now it's being a little bit nice to me again. Let's see, so we got Pom Pom redeeming hydrate. Thank you very much, Pom Pom. We got our first and second being taken, of course, by those that normally do. Thank you, Dorn, for the subscribe for the resubscription. It's always appreciated. And he's going to the grocery store. And uh, do your best nevermore. <laughs> And I need to put Benji on my shoulder. And today, in honor of Edgar Allan Poe, we have a little Raven Benjamin Toast. Hopefully, do what I want him to. There we go. We got our little birdie Benji, being all bird-like and stuff. <laughs> Uh, but how is everybody doing today? How is your Saturday? How is your weekend treating you so far? I'm getting stabbed in the leg by keys, apparently. I'm going to put those keys over here because I don't like being stabbed in the leg by keys. <laughs> Talk smoothly. You're on ASMR mode. Oh, no. I'll get it in one second. I apologize, not the big boss. I am all over the place. I will be right up front right now. I am incredibly nervous. <laughs> Sometimes it's best to just say that information up front. I am very, very nervous right now because I put a lot of work into, into this particular stream. So, I hope it comes across well, but we will start our ASMR in 3, 2, 1. So, there we go. We begin our little quiet ASMR-like voices here. I'm hoping that I'm coming across well, because it says that the connection is unstable, but it doesn't look like it's unstable. We're just gonna have to see how things go. But yes, how is everybody doing? Oh, Benji baby, what's he wearing? He's wearing a little... Hold on, I'll, I'll move him in front of my face so that you can see him a little bit. He has a little... A little raven costume that he made all by himself. Wearing a nice little raven costume. Little tail and his little wings. A little bit of masking tape to hold everything together. <laughs> I had a lot of fun drawing. I had a lot of fun drawing this. I made it a couple of days ago because I'm like, yeah, we got to have Benji be in here. Being as Benji as he. There we go. Uh, also, I got myself a little bit of tea because uh, I made some terrible decisions last night. I was like, you know what? We're going to go ahead and reread all of the poems and the short stories that we have ready for today, which is not too many, but there's a couple, and we can discuss them afterwards and such. But, uh, so I did that for about three hours of just reading stories and figuring out which ones I liked and kind of cutting down the ones that I liked. And, like, and uh, then afterwards I decided to try and entertain a friend of mine. Spooky note, I can do that. Try to entertain a friend. With a bunch of silly little stories and voice acting and such for another three hours afterwards. And, uh, I ended up damaging my throat quite a bit in the process. So, I need to be... <laughs> I had to 
get some extra sleep last, or try to get some extra sleep last night so that I wouldn't lose my voice just before a story reading stream, you know? Also, how about, what's, how's the volume sounding like for the ambience, by the way? Is it decent? Is it too loud? Is it just right? Do we have a, uh, do we have a Goldilocks situation at the moment? I will say, though, just to, just to start before we really get into the stories. Good to go. Thank you very much. Not the big boss. And there's one thing that I do need to go off about a little bit before we get into the, the nitty gritty of the uh, of, of the stories and the tales, etc. You know, we'll, we'll get into it. I'll try and put on my best vocals. And I'll, I'll post links to the actual story so you guys can follow along should you want to. But I have to say this before we do anything else. Edgar Allan Poe did great poetry. His poetry, I really, really like. It had a very nice and smooth flow to it. It was fun. It was entertaining. You know, even for it being, you know, like very, very old, it was still very enjoyable. But some of his short stories are so so long and don't have a punchline if that makes any sense like he will talk he will build up a scene like Tolkien does with his forests and all you'll get at the end is like and you know like but was the like let me describe to you these chambers seven the colors of each and the the gaiety that was produced by them all the lights that shone through the tainted glass windows of the connections to the colors that were actually within the chamber and so it was that 1000 individuals spent for like 40 days and 40 nights in true gaiety and bliss and joy and blah 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 and then all of a sudden it, like, it just ends with just like and then they all died <laughs> imagine you know the ugly barnacle story there once was an ugly barnacle it was so ugly that he died imagine that but the intro is seven paragraphs long. Like, it's not just there once was an ugly barnacle. It would have been, there once was an ugly barnacle. Allow me to explain to you just how ugly he was for the limited period of time. <laughs> Edgar Allan, get to the point. Exactly. And yes, not the big boss. We're obviously doing The Raven. I love The Raven. It is a wonderful, wonderful story. It is very difficult for me as a dyslexic person to read it, but I will do my damnedest because there are some Frickin a freaking platonic shore or pluton plutonian shore who the heck uses the term plutonium plutonian plutonian come on now there we go oh and five minutes are up so i can talk normally again but yeah it was it was very interesting uh, last night because i had like four or five stories that i'm like yeah i definitely want these you know I'm not going to spoil them for you, obviously, except for the raven, because it's the raven. You gotta do the raven. It's, it's, it's like, literally, like, the, the hallmark of Edgar Allan Poe. But, you know, I was reading a couple of other ones, and I'm just like, holy shit, I am halfway through this, and I am so bored. <laughs> like, uh, maybe that's my ADHD talking, maybe that's, um... Can you make your voice sound like James Earl Jones? Oh God, how does he sound again? Oh. I can't, I can't replicate him for a moment. Uh, hold on. Here comes the boy. Jam Jam, thank you so much for the sub. Bonk I will. I'm Bonk Hai Jam Jam. Thank you very much for the sub. It's very appreciated. Thank you. Oh, I do not regret having my cup of tea. My god. <sighs> Sounds like Darth Vader. That I definitely can't do Darth Vader. I would have to talk very, very low and 
try to talk more along the lines like this and this is really straining on my- Actually, it's not that bad. I could talk like this for a while, but good god, does it take a lot of concentration. <laughs> Ugh, I'm really killing the, uh, the spooky ambience right now, aren't I? By giggling like a freaking dipshit. <laughs> we did a Raven video in the 8th grade, and I was starring our cat at the time. And was props the first edited video you ever made. Nice, Pom Pom. Uh, yeah, Pom Pom. Wow. Because of Jam Jam and Pom Pom, my brain is just breaking them down into the syllables. <laughs> But yeah, like, it was just some stories where I'm like, can we just get to the second? Ooh, I forgot something. Apologies, you're gonna get into the, the nitty gritty here for a second. There we go. I forgot that I turned my eyes to face the camera for that little video I made. But yeah, there were some that were just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Oh, this, uh, this fucking paragraph goes on for a while, eh? Whew. Wait a second, how many people in this chat have a nickname to go with their screen name? A nickname to go with their s- Oh, I see. Like, not the big boss is NTBB. Pom Pom Girl is PPG. Uh, Blue Pixels is usually blue. Uh, Lawful does, but I'm not allowed to say it because I've said it once or twice by accident. <laughs> I'm so used to calling them something else. <laughs> uh, Cosmosis is Jam Jam. Uh, Coach Dorn is normally just Dorn, I think. They could call him Coach Dorn or call him Coach. I don't think he would mind either of those. He's not here to defend himself anyway, so. <laughs> Let's see. I don't think Haya's here at the moment, but like Haya Synth is normally... Just Haya, like everyone just usually just calls her Haya. Mostly because you can flow that more easily. I think most people's like nicknames are usually just short forms of their online names. Like, you know, Will Sleeps Not. I think most people will call me Will or Sleeps or Sleeps Not. Not even that. We have Bells. Oh, that's right! Fight Dome is Bells! You're right! Action points is operator, stitches is batter. That's a good call, though stitches used to, uh, his name used to be batter, if I recall correctly. And then uh, he changed it. <sighs> or wheelchair, yes, Blue, you have quite the unique, <laughs> you have quite the, the unique nicknames for me. Let's see, I've got Wheelchair, William. Those are the only two that come to mind off the cuff. And I'm also realizing that you can barely see the bats. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Ah, oh, Lolfo, you could have gone for Willow Pillow. You almost had it. You were two letters off. All you needed was a pinch. And you would have proclaimed the ow at the end for Pillow. <laughs> Please, Mr. Sleeps was my father. Call me Will. And there she is! Haya herself. Hello, Haya. Oh! Oh, those pillows are gonna just come out of frickin' nowhere because of how close I am to the camera. <laughs> You've summoned her, it's true. A rival always knows when their rival is speaking about them. It draws them in. How many times did we call Haya's name? Probably too many. Wilbarrow. <laughs> There's a freaking question. Has anybody here ever done the stupid, like, wheelbarrow? I don't know. I don't know if you'd call it game or exercise or whatever you know where one person like kind of like does the gets on all fours and then one person picks up their legs and walk with them and they have to try and keep up with that and welcome glitch I know I've definitely <laughs> face plants every time no 
<laughs> I've done it a couple of times. I also used to, um, there was a, and I'm doing all right, great, the glitch, thank you for asking. Um, back in the day when we had goats, we had one goat that loved to jump into, uh, one of our wheelbarrows. I don't know why, he just, he, he was this short little goat, he was probably, like, two feet tall. His name was, uh, oh, what was his name? I think it was Carlin. Pretty sure it was Carlin. But he was this, or she was this pain in the ass little devil who just knew how to get out of out of the pen every time, like learned really early and just wouldn't stay in that darn pen and would just run around the barn all the time to the point of where we were just like, yeah, you know, Carlin just runs around. Just, you know, it's just what Carlin does. But she loved wheelbarrow rides. Like if you put some, uh, some hay into a wheelbarrow and put her on top, she would just sit up there. That's just what she would do. She would nibble away at the food a little bit, but for the most part, she just enjoyed the ride. So there was a lot of times where, you know, like she'd walk over to the wheelbarrow right as I filled up it up with hay and she'd be like, bah! and it's just like, you want to go up? And she's just like, stare at me. And I'm just like, ah, and I'd pick her up and put her on there and she'd be like, ha ha, <laughs> and then just be there until I had to eventually take her off again because I needed to, you know, actually toss the hay out onto the onto the feeding area, <laughs> you know, to feed the other goats. <laughs> oh, that freaking goat was a pain in the ass. For those who don't know, um, one of the ways to befriend uh, an animal, is, uh, an easy way, I suppose, though a pain in the butt way, potentially, is to, um... no, she was a pain. <laughs> Well played, Jam Jam. Well played. I stand corrected. Um, so, Carlin was born... When Carlin was born, uh, her mother, I think, had some sort of, like... Um, I don't know what you would call it, but it's it's the same equivalency that some... Uh, that some um, women get, too, when they first give birth, where they just get, like, weirdly disconnected from their kid. I don't remember what it's called. It's like post something, post something trauma, and uh, I think the mother had that because she just refused to 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 feed her kid. Postnatal depression. I think that might actually be it. Yeah. So she like refused to um, to feed Carlin. So you know, like myself and uh, one of my siblings, or my, my sibling and my. Um, and like my dad, we would be like, well, we're not gonna just let her die. So we'd like bottle feed her. So because of that, she was extremely, extremely tame. But because of that, the one thing that's fun when you have farm animals, I love that I'm doing this over like semi eerie ambience. <laughs> but what you didn't know was <laughs> Post Malone depression. Wow. Wow. Well done, Blue. <laughs> um, when an animal becomes familiar with you, they're not afraid of you. And for from a farming perspective, sometimes there is a positive in the uncertainty that your um, that your livestock have with you because it helps you guide them around. You know, they don't quite know what you're doing, so they try to kind of move away from you, which lets you, in turn, guide them to where they need to go. Carlin is not afraid at all. <laughs> so, you know, because of that, she was a menace. <laughs> she was an adorable menace, don't get me wrong. She was quite the menace. <sighs> Apologies, by the way storytelling. I know that we're supposed to be reading stories right now, but my brain is going elsewhere right now because I finally had a half-decent night of sleep, so now, you know, the the poor batteries in my brain that have been brutally abused for the last week finally have some charge back, and they're so used to just emptying out all the charge that they have as fast as they can that right now we're, you know, we're... <laughs> We're kind of supercharged, so... 
for better or for worse, unfortunately. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's still story time, so I think it can't be that bad. <sighs> All right. Uh, let me stretch for a second. Let's get us in the mood a little bit. In the mental state. There we go. We need to be a little bit further back, because otherwise Benji's just going to keep getting clipped. Ooh, which means that I need to change this. Apologies, you're going to see behind the curtain for a moment here while I fix this up. It's just... Yeah, close enough. Stinky note. I'm sorry, Pom Pom. There was a lot of things happening. I will put that on now. Thank you very much for reminding me. Well, it's connected to a hair, so we'll <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> we'll hope for the best. Everyone get comfy. Your immersion. Why is that? There's no. Oh, get out of here, Lion. You're not allowed to be there. There we go. Jeez, freaking line. Thinks it could just come in here and cause all sorts of problems. All right. <gasps> I've been struck in a little. All right. Are you guys ready for our first story? Uh, just so that I'm not looking too, too far away from chat. That wouldn't help anybody, right? Me just sitting here looking away from chat, unable to talk to you guys. Gotta test it. You had to test and see if the pillows were still working. Don't you worry about that. The pillows are still working. I made sure of it. And you're ready? Ugh, I hope I am. <laughs> we got the curse of Carla for... You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. All right. So... If anybody wants to follow along, here is our here is our first story. If you can't handle people sometimes saying words incorrectly, uh, perhaps don't click that link because uh, we're going to definitely be potentially fumbling a little bit from time to time. So I do apologize in advance. Uh, that's just how my brain works, unfortunately. It's a mixture of my ADHD and my dyslexia. Working together to see words and going just like, well, you know, we see say, but instead we're going to say speak, because they mean the same thing, theoretically. <laughs> but, what? We do one more thing before we do this. I'm looking. Lighting. Where's the lighting? Just a bit. Just to make it just a little bit more ominous. Get that light out of the way, too, so that we don't have a problem anymore. You got your blanket? You're so ready? Excellent, Lou. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, here is the Will Sleeps Not uh, retelling of the wonderful story by Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart, a classic. So. <clears throat> True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous had I been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The, dis uh, the disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled. Above all, for the sense of hearing acute, I hear all things in the heaven and in the earth. I hear many things in hell. How, then, am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly, I tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Obje uh, object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. I loved the old man, and he had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes. That was it. <laughs> La 
lost my the spot for a second. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degree, very, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Hold on, I need to definitely change. I need to go to, I need to, go to this. There you go. A little bit more evil. <laughs> I'm not crazy, you're crazy. <laughs> now, th uh, now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I perceived with such caution, with such foresight, with what this dissemination I went to work. I would never, I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I would put a dark lantern closed, closed so that no light shone out, and then thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved slowly, very, very slowly, that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the, hi for the hinge creaked. And I undid it so, just so much that a single ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquired how he had passed the night. For you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked upon him while he slept. Second, quick gulp. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious to open the door. A watch's hand, a watch's minute hand, moved more quickly than mine did. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of the sagacy. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea. Perhaps he heard me, or he moved in his bed suddenly, as if startled. Now, you might think that I drew back, but no. His room was black as pitch with the thickness with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened though, uh, through fear of robbers. And so I knew he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing in steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprung up in the bed, crying out, Who's there? And I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lay down. He was sitting up in bed, listening, just as I had done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Perhaps, or presently, I heard a slight groan. I knew it was a groan of mortal terror. It was not the groan of pain or of grief, oh no! It was a slow, stifled sound that rose from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. 
I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, was welled up in my own bosom, deepening, with its dreadful echo, the terrors that distracted me. I say I know it well. I knew the old man felt me, felt it, and pitied him, though I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had never uh, had been laying awake ever since the first slight noise, when he had turned in his bed. His fear had, had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had to say to himself, he had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chim chimney, only a mouse crossing the floor, nor it is merely a cricket that made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself of these superstitions with these superpositions. But he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of an unprecedented or unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, though he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lay down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little, a crevice in the lantern. So I opened it, you cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until a length of a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out of the service or the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I, gla as I glanced upon it. I saw its perfect distinctness, all of the dull, all a dull blue with the hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damn spot. And now, have I not told you of what, uh, of what you mistake for madness is but an acute, acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I know that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But, e uh, but even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I heard the held the lantern motionless. I tried out steady to keep I could maintain the ray upon the eye meanwhile the hellish tattoo of the heart increased it grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instance it the old man's terror must have been extreme it grew louder I say louder every moment do you mark me well I have told you that I am nervous so I am and now, at the dead hour of night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise, as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder! I thought the heart might must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound must be heard by the neighbors. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. He screeched once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pushed a heavy bed and pushed the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for a few minutes, the heart beat, uh, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man 
was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I work hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. Then I took up three planks from the floors of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so carefully, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash away, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too weary for that. A tub had caught it all. Ha <laughs> ha! When I had made an end of these labors, it was for... What a trouble solver this protagonist is. Am I right? He's a smart boy. When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. Still. Not mouse. You're just a little bit early with that, but good call. We're almost there. When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. Still dark as midnight. As the bell uh, sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been logged at the police station, and they... The officers had been uh, deputed, deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was one of my own dream. The old man, I mentioned, was a sent to the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bid they search, search well. I led them at length to his chambers. I showed them his treasure, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, with wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularity, singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerfully, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself growing pale and wishing them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued to gain definition. Until, at length, I found the noise was not within my ears. No doubt now I had grown pale. But I talked more frantically with, the hei with a heightened voice. If the sound continued, what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much such a sound of a watch made when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for air, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I rose and argued for trifles, in a high key and with violent gestations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the room to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I, fo I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I sat 
and gr uh, and gr and grated upon the boards. The noise arose all over and continuously increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they did not hear? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. And anything was better than this agony. Anything was better than more, uh, was more tolerable than this. Ah, sometimes words. Er. Heck. No, we'll do it our own way. Anything was more tolerant than this suffering. I could bear their hypocritical smiles no longer. I, f I felt like I might scream or die. And now, again, hark. Louder, 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 louder. Villains, I screeched. Disassemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks here, here, here. It's the beating of his hideous heart. <sighs> nice timing, Pom Pom. And that is the Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. <sighs> Go back to our normal expression here for a moment. Let's take a breath. How did everybody enjoy that? I think it's probably one of the better stories that I know of Edgar Allan Poe. It is a lovely, lovely story. And thank you, Pom Pom, for the hydrate. It is definitely written in a fantastical way. Like, it is very... It... The writing captures the narrator's general state of mind really, really well, I think. I thought, like... The Telltale Heart is probably one of the earliest uh, Edgar Allan Poe stories that I've ever um, heard. I think I read it in high school, and it was one of the stories that kind of got me more into short stories and poetry. Like, I dove a little bit into Edgar Allan Poe during high school. Fortunately, not as much as I could have, but it was definitely... It was definitely something that kind of sparked a fascination with writing. And also for, like, this style, you know, the, like, get into the person's mind and ponder how, how the human brain tries to rationalize how they approach things. You know, and he understands this nameless narrator. He understands... At least that people see him as crazy. But the human mind does not allow for itself to be seen as crazy. It's a natural thing. To quote, you know, to quote Principal Skinner from The Simpsons, am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. But in this case, am I mad? No, how could I be mad when I am so put together? Also, if I got a little loud at the end, I apologize. <laughs> I was kind of getting into it. <laughs> and definitely uh, props to Not Mouse. Like, if you had been five seconds later with that redeem, it would have been perfect. Like, it genuinely would have been a wonderful, wonderful moment. It was still great. Don't get me wrong. You did great. And it would just would it just a, almost there, you know? It's like when you try to throw the punchline in somewhere before some, like try to steal someone's punchline, and you do it just before they finish the setup, and you're just like, shit, that last half a sentence needed to be there in order for me to make this joke. A spoopy note, we can put a spoopy note. Yeah. I'll put this one. Oh, come on now. Fine. Start from this. 
There we go. Didn't realize the footstep. Yeah, I added a couple of new redeems specifically for this. I'm going to try to add redeems uh, every Saturday for this month that will work with the topic at hand. So for today, we've got Edgar Allan Poe stories. So, you know, we've got footsteps. We've got kind of semi-ghostly like sounds. And we have... That's the third one that I put in. I can't even remember. Put three. Yeah, the ghost noises. Spooky noises. That's right. There's two different types of noises. There is... Let me just redeem them so everyone can hear them for future uses should they want to. This is the spooky noises. Ooh. Spooky scary. We have the ghost noises, which Pom Pom used earlier. Which again, I feel like is just a nice overarching sound for everything. And then finally, we have the footsteps, which are a little on the quiet side. Hopefully you guys can even hear them. They're a little bit quiet, but I couldn't find any better ones. Because uh, apparently you either have soft and subtle footsteps or you have... And it's just like, well, that's not what we're looking for here. <laughs> One thing I do want to just mention really quickly, just for me, because right now I'm a little bit... I still got the nervous jitters. Um, the one thing that can be a little bit irritating when you really get into a story is when you have something like dyslexia. And, you know, you really want to get into it and all of a sudden you hit a word that you can't read. And it just, you know, in this case it was, uh, derision, I think is the, is the, is how you would actually say the word. But I got stuck on it. It was just like, shit, I don't know how to read that because my brain wants to read decision, but I know that it's not right. So I ended up just, after a few seconds, just being like, nope, this is taking too long. We're, we're getting locked into place and that's no good. Let's just cut that out and just replace it with a word that might be similar. That, and that's also the fun thing, right? Because we're do talking about Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe loves to use um, fancy words. And sometimes those fancy words can be very difficult to read. <laughs> Has anyone read the Bunnicala? Bunnicala? Bunnicula. Well, the fact that I can't even say it, I'm going to go ahead and say no, Pom Pom, sorry. Bun ik eula. Bunicula? Bunicula? Bunicula. Bunny dr You're kidding me. Are you serious, uh, Pom Pom? Is this a real thing? Oh my goodness. You loved them as a kid? I definitely did not read them. Um, because I grew up in the Netherlands, I read a lot of Dutch stories. <laughs> Bro uses them $5 words because his pay was so low. Still? He has some words that he really likes to use that I've found in some of his other short stories. He'll use them too. He uses them sparingly, like once per, like once per story, but you're just like, hmm, I'm spotting that word again. The first one is a Telltale heart like story. That's pretty cool, Pom Pom. Ah, oh, sorry. The yawning. No, when I was younger, um, there was this series, a Dutch um, children book series called Pluk van de Petflet. 
which is essentially Pluck is the name. So it's Pluck from, like, the apartment building, basically. And it's it's just this little, like, little story series of a kid named Pluck. And he goes around with his little red wagon with a little crane at the end. And he goes and helps people and is, goes on his little adventures. Hello, Chocolate Disco. How are you? And also, like I said, Dorn, welcome back. Since I read it before the Telltale Heart, when we read Poe in school. <laughs> That's funny. Yo, indeed. Yo is indeed the name of the game. Ah. So, just so everybody's aware, I think that is the only short story that we're going to be reading. The rest is po is the different poetry that he has. The only scary stories that you read? Ah, oh, goosebumps! What was it? Um, I read, what is it? The Cuckoo Clock of Doom is one of the ones that I remember. And what is it? Don't Let the Monster Out? Or The Monster in the Basement? Something along those lines. I can't quite remember what it was called anymore. That one had such a stupid ending, though. <laughs> like, the Goosebumps were great stories, but they were so... But some of them were so silly. Especially, like, their endings were just like, Tee-hee, look, everything's fixed. Oh, no, there was the other one. Uh, the Haunted Mask, I think is what it was called. Oh, excuse me for my aunts. Yeah, I definitely remember the ghosts, the, the, the goosebump stories. There were some that I looked at and was just like, yeah, I don't want to read that. That sounds scary. <laughs> but then there were other ones where I'm just like, hell yeah, let's read this creepy thing. They still horrified you. <laughs> what spooky stuff did you miss? We just finished reading the Telltale Heart. <laughs> Mr. Darn. So you've only missed one out of two, four, out of six things that we're going to be reading today. Though the rest of them are Edgar Allan Poe, uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe um, poems, rather than uh, short stories. Because as I mentioned earlier, his short stories, oh lordy, they are long. <laughs> And some of them are dry. <laughs> like, oh, that's it? We did frickin' six paragraphs of build-up just for a- and then they all died? <laughs> nice, not mouse. Well done. <laughs> Your job is to make them not dry. I tried. Last night, I spent, like, three three hours reading short stories and poems and everything else and just some of them I was halfway through and I'm like I can't make this interesting it's so boring <laughs> like it's just like ugh really oh, why of all things am I starting to yawn now bleh All right, going to read. Thank you for the hydrate pom pom, that's appreciated. Drink more water, I just finished my tea. I've been drinking the liquids of sorts. Thank 
you, Blue. Alright. We're going to read one of the first poems that I have. Uh, here it is for everybody who wants to follow along. Alone by Edgar Allan Poe. I don't think I have to change uh, my expression this time because this is a lot more of a a calm poem. But without further ado. <clears throat> From childhood's hour I have not been. As others were, I have not seen. As others saw, I could not bring. My passions. My passions from a common spring. From the same source I had not taken, my sorrow I could not awaken. The, uh, my heart to joy at the same tone. All I've loved, I've loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn. From every depth of good or ill, the mystery which binded me still. From the torrent or from the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in the autumn hint of gold. From the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm, and the cloud that took the form. When the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. <laughs> it's a simpler one, but I did like it. It, pa it paints a nice picture. Or it has a lot of nice visual um, painting with words, which is stuff that I very much enjoy. I like when when poems and stories use various methods to try and um, give you a visual. And though it's not going to be the same visual for everyone, it still, it still paints with certain colors that everyone can still notice. Oh, you, you did decent, Pom Pom. You almost had it. I have no issues with what you what you did. I think it was a good attempt. <sighs> but again, it's a simpler one, right? Like it's not particularly dreadful or spooky. It just has it's it's melancholy and and has kind of a sadness to it. It's like a person reflecting back on what what's happened and kind of what and kind of where he is right now and i think that that's kind of a nice a nice feeling in some regard you know because everyone's had that before in your quiet hours where you sat by yourself for a bit and you've looked back on your life and pondered the mistakes and the sorrows and the pains that you've gone through you know just to let you remind yourself of how you got to where you are Sorry, I have to readjust a little bit here. <sighs> Out of curiosity, has anybody here ever tried poetry that wasn't just school stuff? Would you say that you have a higher tolerance for spooky stuff than you do for gaming? Hmm... I would say so. Games scare the shit out of me. Words, I would say, not as much. Writing or reading? Uh, specifically writing. Has anybody here, like, ever had, like, their, their poetry phase, so to speak? You've done poetry of plenty? Hell yeah, Dorn. Nice. I used to, when I was in high school, do the classic, like, <laughs> like, edgy boy poetry, you know? <laughs> but after I made it to, like, the fourth one, I was just like, man, this is dull. I should be writing about something maybe a little bit better. <laughs> Uh, 
But I think everybody goes through their, like, how to say, their cringe phase, if you will. Whatever the cringe phase might happen to be. It could be, like, your more gothic time. It could be your, your like, more emo state. It could be your edgy state. It could be your scene state. You know, like, a thing that when you, you finally look back on it, like, five years later, you're like, oh, God. Burn all the pictures. Destroy every account I ever had. Social media account I ever had. Just burn it all. I wish for it never to exist anymore. <laughs> Mostly put together with good. Hey, that's nice, Snot Mouse. I like that. Strive to always be <laughs> in a state that will cause future growth. Ah. Pom Pom isn't cringe. She's weaponized cringe. <laughs> but it's like she's using one of those reverse revolvers. You know what I mean? She's just, she's weaponized it upon herself. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Although I think in some cases, you know, like to be a little retrospective, and maybe this is completely incorrect, but this is just a thought that's crossed my mind right now. I feel like looking back at ourselves and going, ugh, cringe, is just more a display of like how much you've changed as a person. You know, like enjoying, I don't know, like the super edgy humor and the, the, the shock comedy, for instance, and then looking back at it later and being like, ah! Where do I find we will in a snitch? To continue forward with a flick of a switch. I cannot fat home it burn it like a witch. I found will alone on the platform of Twitch. <laughs> I love the Dutch version of that. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> hey, I want to reach uh, the state of uh, six-year-olds who no longer care what anyone thinks that they can live their best life as fast as possible. Hey, you know what, Pom Pom? There's nothing wrong with that. Also, well done, Dorn. 10 out of 10. <laughs> hey, Mandalorian, how's it going? <gasps> oh no, my ambience, it's over. Refresh. Can't just have silence? That's illegal. Can't just have that. What else would there be? Me talking to myself? Unacceptable. You do your best to aspire? Well, seems like you're doing quite well then, Dorn. I wish I could make up poetry um, on the fly, but I can't unless it's written. And even then, it's usually not very good. <laughs> I, um... I used to do with a friend of mine, we did for about three months every day at the same time we would do uh, a haiku. Like one of us would pick a mood or a tone or a topic and then we would have like five to ten minutes to write a haiku. And then later we ended up being like, don't always want to do haiku, let's also have limericks. And you know, those were very fun. But, unfortunately, a uh, friend didn't want to do it anymore, and I'm somebody who, if the plan is for myself and someone else to do it, then if they're not doing it, then I don't do it because my weird OCD brain is just like, well, it can't be done anymore. I'm also glad to hear that you're in a good mood, Mandalorian. Or in a great mood, rather. I stand corrected. Limericks like the county. Uh, I don't. Th <laughs> I'm, I'm presuming that the county of Limerick is not a. Uh, what is it again? A B B A. Is that how it is? No, it's A A B B A. Is that it? Limerick. How does it go again? Limerick poem. Oh, it is A A B B A. That's right. Oh, 
we used to do, we used to do buggy haiku you? What? Like buggy... No punchbacks? Wait. Oh, you're ringing a, you're ringing a bell right now, but I can't quite think of what it is. Lurking because about to drive to pick up dinner. Absolutely fine, Jam Jam. Thank you very much for the lurk, and thank you very much for stopping by. Always so, so my slipper. <laughs> What's always punching me? Well, don't let them, Pom Pom. Like, the moment that you hear them say anything, just hit them first. Don't even finish the sentence. Just swing. <laughs> don't let them do that to you. I had to make up a haiku on the spot instead. Ooh. That's smart. That's actually really smart. Then I wonder if I can remember this one that I wrote once upon a time. It's a really, really dumb limerick. Oh, and of course Discord is going to die on me. Oh. Let's see if I can find it in the chat. It's a very, very, I'm just, I'm remembering what it is now and I'm realizing it's far too lewd. <laughs> or it's, it's very, it's very crude humor. Although granted it's a limerick and limerick are, limericks are supposed to be, um. Uh, limericks are supposed to be a little bit crude. Do a poem about Katu. <laughs> All right, so the first limerick I ever wrote, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to read it, but it's really, really, really stupid. All right. So again, for those who don't know, a limerick, the a limerick poem, the idea is the pattern is a a b b a. So the first two uh, lines and the last line all have to. Um have to rhyme, and then the third and fourth line have to rhyme. Bells, get the bonk ready, because I know you're going to be upset with me about this. Sarah loved her bright-colored sock that was red and had birds of a flock. But it was to her shame that she found out the game that her brother used it on his cock. <laughs> Worth it! Worth it! <laughs> yeah, let's just uh, add a little bit of my own poetry into this little poetry reading session, shall we? <laughs> You already knew where it was going. <laughs> Come on, we've been doing nothing but spooky. We gotta, we gotta get, we got, we gotta sometimes draw. In. Wow, that's a lot of stinky notes. All right, all right, let's get some stinky notes. How many notes do we have? We have three, by the look of it. I'm sorry, by the way, Dor. I hope you're okay. <laughs> you know what? I don't care. I'm proud of of my dumb little poem. There we go. We got our stinky nose. <laughs> Come on. I'm feeling unjustly persecuted right now. Mm 
you missed the poem. What happened? <laughs> Look at the subtitles. Oh my god. <laughs> ah. You know, that, that moment was for me. It was definitely for me. Ah, goodness. Ah, sorry, let me catch up on chat really quick. Everybody got very, as soon as you heard sock. Oh, I see, lawful. You were on to me from the beginning. <laughs> You pick up your friend, and they will act as a turret, and I will be the tank, and another friend of mine will be the shield or the armor. You could say that is our paintball tactics. I did paintball uh, a couple of times back in the day. Unjustly persecuted just enough. Right? Unacceptable. Look at all these, look at all these freaking sticky notes now. How am I supposed to read scary stories when I'm covered in stinky notes? <laughs> All right. Enough of this nonsense now. We'll move on to the next one. Make sure that I actually grab it. All right. Our next one is going to be the Conqueror Worm. Spooky note, you got it. Excuse me? No, on the clothing. No. No. Fine, shoulder it is. The Conqueror Worm. <laughs> Thanks, Pom Pom. Appreciate you. Back to spooky. Exactly. We gotta go back to spooky. <sighs> All right. We'll go back to spooky. I promise. Here we go. Now we're going to be reading The Conqueror Worm. It's a short one. By Edgar Allan Poe. Do I have a good face for this? I suppose I can read it with an angry face, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We'll just do it casually. Take one more sip of water here really quick. <sighs> Lo, tis a gala night. Within the lonesome latter years, an angel throng be winged, and bedite and bedite in veins and drowned in tears, sat in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra breached fitfully, or breathed fitfully, the music of the spheres, mimes in the form of God on high muttered and mumble low, and hither and thither fly. Mere puppets are they who come and go, at bidding of very of vast formless things, that shift the scenery to and fro, flipping, uh, flapping from out their uh, cadent wings, invisible woe. That motley drama, oh be sure, it shall not be forgot. With a phantom chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not. Through a circle that ever returneth to a self some spot, and much of madness and more of sin, and horror the soul of the plot. But see amid the mimic uh, rout a crawling shape intrude, the blood-red thing that writhes from out a scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes with mortal pangs, the mimes become its food, and, and seraphs uh, sob a vermin at vermin fangs in human gore imbued. Out, out are the lights, out all! 
and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pal, or uh, yeah, pal, comes down with the rush of a storm, while the angels, all pla uh, pallid and wane, uprise, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy, man, and the hero, the conqueror, worm. It's almost as bad as the Keanu clip. <laughs> I actually really like this. It's very simple. It's a very simple and... And Stitch is hello. Uh, it's a very simple poem, but I like it. You know, it's... At least from my perspective, it really has that attitude of just like... Uh, it kind of brings both the attitude of life is a story and the players must play their parts... Uh, as well as the idea of we spend all of our time fancying ourselves over angels and gods and devils and, and all of these things that are beyond concept. Like, we can argue about them until our faces are blue, but at the end of the day, the play is the tragedy, man, and the winner, or and, the hero, and its hero is the conqueror worm. In the end of the day, we can argue about policies, we can argue about gods, we can argue about angels and demons all, but at the end of the day, we all return to the dirt. In the end. Yeah, but you can eat worms too. Mmm. <laughs> Dorn, that has the same attitude of, uh, what the heck is the name of that movie? Uh, where the guy's just like, don't you know an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind? No, it doesn't. You've got one guy left with one eye. How's a blind man supposed to stab a guy's eye? <laughs> That's the trick. If the worms eat the people and you eat the worms, you become immortal. Or, alternatively, you're performing... Um, Cannibalism by proxy. You're doing cannibalism adjacent. Another spoopy note. We're going to be covered in spoopy notes by the end of this stream. Put it next. We'll put it by Benji. There we go. Uh, boo, cannibalism is boring. <laughs> and another stinky note, my goodness. Was just a joke, guys. Jeez. <laughs> All right. We are going to take a quick five to 10 minute break so I can recompose myself for a moment because I'm a little bit scatterbrained. For, for the for a sec we're gonna go ahead and uh take that little time to breathe i hope that everybody gets up and stretches maybe grab yourself a cup of tea we're starting to get into the cooler the cooler parts of the year always nice to have a little bit more you know a little bit more uh, warmth to yourself and uh yeah so I'll be back in five to ten minutes if you can and are able to. I hope that you get up and stretch. Grab yourself something to eat. Grab yourself something to drink. Make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. I will be back in five to ten minutes. And I will see you guys very soon. Insert evil chuckle here. Right. No, hold on. Gotta do it properly. I will be back in five to ten minutes. And I will see you guys very soon very soon. <laughs>
No, I did it right. Don't worry, I went to the right one. I did it. I did the right thing. Totally nailed it. First try. Let's go, boys and girls. All right. So, while I was quickly taking a break, my brain decided to actually come up with another freaking limerick. It's a clean one, though. So, remember that that's... Remember that before I start getting stuff thrown at me. Wow, I like that Bells is just like, nah, this SOB gonna throw some mad shit at us. Just hit him already. Gotta read. The poem Pom Pom made, then mine. Uh, where are they? I don't know where they are. I mean, I just see, <laughs> I just see knives. Go past the evil palms. I'm looking, but I don't see anything. I think I might be, might sleep in a second. Uh, must be rested for the war that is about to ignite but that's a good choice Mandalorian I hope you have a good night thank you very much for stopping by though always good having you here <laughs> well, I see Dorns <laughs> Oh, I see. I see. Oh, lordy. All right. Well, here's the dumb one that I came up with. I'll read it out loud really quick so that we can move on. When your life is feeling low and all that's left is dreary and woe, then remember the glee that you know when you see the acting of Willem Dafoe. <laughs> there you go. See, that was clean. That was clean, that was friendly. Wow. <laughs> I did my best, and I still get attacked for it. Harumph, I say. <laughs> What's wrong, Jam Jam? Was that not a good one? Came up with it in like a minute. Do you think... Did you just happen to think about Will Defoe? Actually, no. I. But my first thought was just like, when life is just full of... Uh, is just down and low, and I was just like, huh, can I take that somewhere? You're off. Good night, lads. Have yourself a good night, Mandalorian. Hope you sleep well. The attack is applauded. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. <laughs> All right. We've got three poems left. Two of them are short. One of them is a little bit on the longer side. And the longer one is the one that we've all been waiting for. So we're leaving that one to last. I'm going to hope that I've kind of got my brain recalibrated because I feel like I'm fumbling over these words a little bit and I don't know why but say la vie as it were 
So, our next one is going to be Spirits of the Dead by Edgar Allan Poe. I don't know why I keep saying Edgar Allan by Edgar Allan Poe, but still. It's a lot of sticky notes. What happened? Uh, I made a really dumb limerick joke, and people didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> yeah, I tried to ma I tried to make a funny, and uh, they did not appreciate the funny. <laughs> He deserved them, don't worry. Ah, probably. I, um, so limericks have a tendency to be more on the crude side. So I, I, uh, I told them the first crude limerick that I wrote this year. And, uh, they didn't think that was very funny. But, uh, I think it's funny. Uh. All right. Is everybody ready for Spirits of the Dead by Edgar Allan Poe? We'll see how this goes. I will send you, I could send you the clip. <laughs> it was a good clip though. Pom pom, well done. I used a bad word in it. Going to go watch some spooky movies with my sister. Thank you for streaming and have a wonderful night. You have yourself a great rest of the night too, Stitches. I hope you enjoy the. Mo I hope you enjoy your movies. Get heckin' spooked and such. Ugh, the yawning. Apologies. Ugh, I should have done the frickin'. The big hard hitters at the beginning so that the end ones, it would be fine if I fumbled over them a little bit. But still. Ah, all right, everybody. Let's go. Spirits of the dead. Thy soul shall find itself alone mid dark thoughts of gray tombstone. Not one of all the crowd to pry into thine hour of secrecy. Oh, it's pre. Sorry. Of pre. Uh, be silent to thine solitude. Be silent in thy in thy solitude, which are not a lo uh, loneliness. For then the spirit of the dead who stood in life before thee are again. In death around thee and their will shall then overshadow thee. Be still. The night, uh, though clear, shall frown, and the stars shall look not down, for their high thrones, uh, from their high thrones in the in the heaven, with the light like hope for mortals given. But their red orbs, without beam, to thy weary shall, weariness shall seem. As a burning and a fever which would cling to thee forever. But uh, twill, but twill leave thee as each star with the dewdrop flies afar. Ooh, good timing, Pom Pom. I like that. Uh, now our thoughts uh, thou canst not banish. Now our visions never to vanish. No more like dewdrop from the grass, for thy soul shall they pa for th for thy soul shall they pass. A breath, the breath of God is still, and the mist upon the hill, shadowy, shadowy, yet unbroken, is a symbol and a token. How it hangs upon the trees, a mystery of mystery. And yeah, Pom Pom, that was a really, really good time. Well done. Hope you guys can hear the footsteps. <laughs> I hope you can hear them. <laughs> it 
it's a simple one. It's not the it's not the most potent, but again, it gives a nice little visual, right? The idea of just being in like this truly dark and misty place with like nothing but the perceived spirits around you. And some sort it has a it has a sensation that there might even be more like mourning of some sort. Like you're you're standing before something and letting and just being silent while the spirits kind of move around you. Oh, I think I think it's a good one personally. The only man from Nantucket that I know is from, oh, what was it called again? Ask a Ninja. There once was a man from Nantucket who kept all his swords in a bucket. He started to spin and exclaimed with a grin, when I let this thing go, you best duck it. Sorry, getting a little bit tanked for some reason. I think I just got way too nervous at the beginning of the day and now it's like seeped my energy, which is no good. No good at all. But that means we're just going to have to press onwards and make sure that we at least get everything done before, before the time is up. You do that, I feel that pom pom. When you leave work early. <laughs> you get too excited. Oh, I wasn't excited. I was nervous as fuck. Pardon my language. And I'm too exhausted to do anything. Well, that's the fun thing, right? You get you get those little patterns, and you recognize the patterns, but you don't do anything about them. I know that's me as well, where it's just like, ah, I'm so nervous. Saw the clip. Yeah, it was well-deserved. Are you sure not the big boss? Knock off Will's team. <laughs> Replace it with the W. Limerick Defoe. Oh, so that one's fine. That one's okay. No problems with that one. The trick is to not care, and then you'll never be nervous. The problem, Dorn, is once the nervous is the nervous has set in, it's too late. Ling, hello. Are you popping in just to say hello and then goodbye? Oh, <gasps> she did. What a champion. Just karate chopped me with the hello and then ran away. You feeling a bit under the weather? Oh no, I hope that it gets better soon. I know that you're still recovering, so I hope that that, that blech feeling disappears soon. Thank you, Ling. It is appreciated. Hi, bye. <laughs> oh, Hibbert. <laughs> Not to say. What do you mean? What are you fixing? Oh, Hibbert. All right. We're going to just immediately go to the next one so that I can just get the get through these at a reasonable pace. For I do enjoy doing this, but it also makes me sleepy <laughs> for some reason. Which is no good. So. Annabelle Lee. Ah! Pom-pom, please. 
such cruelties will not bring me consciousness. Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. And thank you for the hydrate. Give me one second. I'm just readjusting my chair. Chair is fighting me. I see not mouse is taking a different approach on this. Just throwing sleep at me instead. Big boss, thank you for the stretch. Uh, if you guys are able to, please join me in a good stretch. Uh, uh, didn't know I needed that. Thank you, not the big boss. That actually helped quite a bit. Whew. All right. Annabelle Lee. It was many and many a year ago in the kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. Ringo, I will grab that for you right now. You say spoopy at a spoopy. And Ringo, hello, how's it going? God, what the heck are you attached to? Get on, get on over by the arm. Does that work? Put it there so that's mostly visible. Stay on the arm. There we go. All right. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love. I and my Annabelle Lee. With a love that the winged ser seraphs in the heavens coveted her and me. <laughs> hello, everyone. Hello, hello. And this was the reason that long ago, in a kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee. So that her high-born kingsman came and bore her away from me and shut her up in a suf... Sefl... That is the weirdest... I'm just going to say tower. To shut her up in a tower in a kingdom by the sea. The angels not have hap... The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envy, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of a cloud that night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love was stronger by far than love, for those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, could ever disever, could ever decipher my soul from, my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lay by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her tower there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. I don't think it's supposed to be tower. I think I fucked that up a little bit, but still. I still love it. I still think it's a great poem. It's very repetitive, but I love the flow and the feel of it. It's got a very nice sound. Well, let's see how the frick to say this word. Sepulcher. Sepulcher. Oh, it's a small room or monument cut in stone or, or cut in rock or built of stone in which a dead person is laid or buried. She should have worn yellow socks. Like Susie? Pardon? 
sepulchre. Sepulchre. My dyslexia butt says nay nay to that. She wasn't his wife at the start of the poem, but they were in love, you see. She was so fair, and I think he would dare to love that Annabelle Lee. <laughs> Wow, nicely done, Blue. Nice. Well, I said tower, but I goofed, unfortunately. Just saying he got freaky with a corpse? He didn't say he got freaky with a corpse. None of the denied in her tomb. Ooh. You're right. He had, Or at least he definitely slept in the tomb with her. Lewd. Uh, excuse me. Her name was Sarah and she had red socks. Miss Lawful. Wait, what? Is the story about necrophilia? I don't think so. I think the story is a lot more innocent than that. It's more of the idea of their, you know, like he was truly and uh, completely in love with her and just could not be, could not leave her side. So even when she died, he laid with Annabelle Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain had to s really Sarah and Red is lewd to you, Lawful. I have a lot of questions about how your life works. <laughs> Reminds me of the song Last Dance with Mary Jane. Last dance with Mary Jane. One more something to kill the pain. I unfortunately don't know the song very well. I'm um, Petty and the Heartbreakers. <laughs> really stretching for that one, eh, Jam Jam? Don't worry. I try to function. Yeah, no, you made it this far, Lawful. I think you're fine. That was the scary one. The scary one, I mean, it's a very difficult to read one. And I'm going to try my damnedest. But uh, it uses a lot of, uh, as Not Mouse said, $5 words. And uh, I might fumble a little bit. So if I do, I apologize. I will do my damnedest. Thank you for the hydrate. Necrophilia is not scary. It's not necrophilia, though. There was another story like that. I cannot remember for the life of me what the story was. Um, <sighs> what is it called? is that story? It's the man whose wife, I think, died on their wedding day? Something? But he couldn't let her go, so he, like, took care of the corpse for a long time. And then finally one day they went to investigate him, and they, they couldn't find him, and he was in, like, this secret back room where he kept the wife. But the creepy part was is that when they found him, he was laying on his back and the wife's arms were wrapped around him and they were wrapped around him after he had died. Ooh. 
I just can't remember what the heck it is anymore. Oh, I wish I could remember. Hold on, I'm doing a little bit of Googling here to see if I can remember. I don't know if I'll ever remember. Who knows? Maybe I'll try to find it and make it one of the one of the stories that we read. Because right now we're we're dedicated to Edgar Allan Poe, obviously. Uh, next week we're probably going to do Lovecraft, which is very exciting for me. I love Lovecraft, despite uh, the questionable things within his writing. <laughs> Back from getting dinner, now you have to actually eat it. BRB, absolutely fine. Jam Jam, I hope you enjoy your dinner. Remember a story from the 90s of a guy who kept digging up corpses and kept mating with them. Uh, I mean, there was also, ooh, was that? No, it wasn't Ted Bundy. Mm. Yes. Jeffrey Dahmer. That's it. Yeah, he drilled holes in the sides of the heads of his victims. At least one or two of them. And what was it? Battery? Was it like car battery acid or like warm water? I don't know how we went towards this topic. Oh wait, yes I do. Although I don't recall. Did Dahmer actually do anything to the corpses? I thought he just like embraced them, didn't he? Mostly just like used them as like teddy bears in some regard. People got mad his Netflix show got the LGBT. Really? I mean, he was, he did prey on other men, but that was also the reason that, no, they didn't, um, that they didn't catch him for so long, because, you know, that was a big problem back in the day. Like, there was a giant, uh, spree of killings, I think, in Northern California, because the cops were afraid of, quote, like, the gays. And it was like, so they just be like, oh, well, you know, like, they just kill each other sometimes. You know, it's just a lover's quarry. And it, it fucking crazy. I don't remember that guy anymore. Oh, I just listened to a podcast about him recently. I think it was in Cali. What was his name? Randy Kraft. You want to read a fucking creepy boy. Randy Kraft. Randy Kraft has between 16 and 67 victims. They're not sure. It's, uh, yeah. Randy Craft is pretty fucked. And yeah, have a, have a good dinner, Jam Jam. <laughs> if you can have that tag. Can't be all unicorns and rainbows. I mean, you're right, but it's still weird. It's still a bit weird. You know, it's, it's still just like, it's LGBT. It's just like, well, yes, cause Dahmer went after other men. So he was indeed gay, but I don't know. It, it, there are people out there that are going to see that as just like, you see the proof? 
Yeah, Blue gets it. Randy Kraft. The police literally couldn't investigate on him because they were like, ooh, gay, no thank you. Yeah, exactly. That was legitimately a thing that was happening. It was insane. He would literally kill victims, like torture them, like horrifically for hours. And then just like drive along the highway and just shove them out of the side of his car at high speeds. And the fun thing is during that time, there were like two other serial killers in that area operating with a very similar MO. So it was really difficult to figure out who was who and what was what. Anyway, I apologize for going down this negative road. Ah! My name is Caillou. He was told not to eat the carrot souffle. But the carrot awakened what he had mistaken for something that turned me gay. <laughs> is this because Kaju is in love with me? Is that what this is about, Dorn? You can tell me if you want to. <laughs> but also, thank you very much for the bits. The text to speech, yeah. It, it tries to read it in, in a Dutch. In, in Dutch, so it comes across as kind of weird. Now I just wanted to make a joke about Kaju. <laughs> bravo. Indeed, bravo. What's the will willy that ain't my business? <laughs> Insert the, uh, what is it? Like Kermit the Frog drinking tea gif here. Just like, but that's not my business. Zip. Ah, <sighs> okay. I think it's time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> said he was a racist. He had a taste for dark meat. Uh, just, just the worst kind of people. Fascinating stuff to look into, but good lord, you need a you need a half decent stomach for it because there are just some truly horrible people out there. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, what we were clearly all waiting for. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. I will do my best to read this to the best of my abilities. I might fumble a few times. Apologies in advance. I will do my dangdest, though. So... Quoth him. I'll do my dangdest. All right. The raven. <clears throat> yeah, one more sip of water really quick. No, I'll have a sip of tea. It'll probably be better. Time to make sure everything... Benji's been waiting for this so long. Look at him. It's true. Benji's been waiting. He's just been excitedly waiting. Just bouncing around on my head being like, it's almost there. We're going to be there really soon. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten or volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly nodding, slightly did there come a tapping. Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. As distinctly I remember it was in a bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. 
Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly had I sought to borrow from my books, Sir... Surcease of Sorrow. <sighs> sorrow for my lost Lenore, for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden who the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. The silken, sad, uncertain r uh, rustling of every purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terror never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, Tis some visitor, entrenching entrance uh, at my chamber door. Some late visitor, entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more. Presently, so, uh, presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, I said, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, so gently you were rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you, ere I open wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Thank you, Pom Pom. <laughs> Deep into that darkness peering, I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal had dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And only words there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo muttered back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard the tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, I said, surely there is something at my window. At my window lace. Let me see then, what thereat is. This mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open then, I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the stately, sa saintly days of yore. And welcome back, Chocolate Disco. Oh no! Okay, we're good. It's all fine. Not the least obeisance made he. Not a moment, not a minute stopped or stayed he. But then mine of lord or lady perched upon my chamber door. Perched upon the bust of palace. Just above my chamber door. Perched and sat. And nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling, my sadness, my sadness fancy into smiling, by the grave stern decor of the countenance it wore. Thou, uh, thou the, uh, thou the crest be shone and shaven, though, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plat platonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled at this unga ungain ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly. Though its answer little meaning, little reverie, little reverie bore. 
for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven sat lonely on his placid bust, speaking only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, only friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by the reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, I said, what it, what it utters is only stock in store, caught for some unhappy master whom some unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his song one burden bore. Till the dredges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven still guiling all my fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of the bird and bust and door. And then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy upon fancy thinking about what ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in uh, croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose To the fowl without, to the fowl whose uh, fierce eyes now burned into my bosom's core, this, this and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloating over, uh, or, it should be or I believe, a uh, gloat, uh, yeah, gloating or. But those velvet violet lightings with the yes blue. Oh no, I'm having a ridiculous amount of time even trying to get the words out properly. There will be no voice acting today. I am fumbling as it is, and I am doing my best to manage to even stay on to on topic. Those velvet, uh, violet linings with the lamplight, uh, go, see, with the lamplight glow, with the lamplight gloating over, she shall pass, ah, nevermore. Then, methinks, the air grows denser, perfumed by some unknown censer, swung by a seraphim whose footfalls whose footfalls tinkled on the tuffled floor. Wretch! I cried. Thy God hath lent thee. By the angels he thus sent thee. Oh, I really should have read this one first. Oh my God. Respite! Respite! And... How do I fuck up the last fucking thing so badly? God damn. Inhale, exhale, we're good. Respite, respite, and nepalin, uh, nepinth from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff, the kind nepinth, and forget this lost Lenore. 
Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, I say, thing of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil. Whether temper, temperer sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate yet no und undaunted. Desolate yet all undaunted. On this desert land enchanted. On this home by horror haunted. Tell me truly, I implore. Is there, is this balm in Galette? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Quick hydrate. Prophet, I said, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. By that heaven had bent, uh, that bends above us. By that God that we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aiden. It shall clasp a sainted maiden, who the angels named Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, who the angels named Lenore. Quoth the raven. Nothing more. Be that word our sign of parting, beast or fiend, I screeched, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonium shore. Leave not blank, uh, leave not black uh, plum as a token that lie the soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thine beak from out my heart, and take thy form off from my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, uh, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the, uh, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just outside, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamp light over him streaming through his shadow on the floor. A streaming throws his shadow on the floor. My soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Well done, Pom Pom. You're getting your timings really good. And there you go, our final poem, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Apologies for my little, mom little moment in there. This was the one that I was most excited to write and unfortunately, or to read, and unfortunately my brain, when I am really determined to do something and I fumble it, not a good time. <laughs> But we did it, and I appreciate you all being here while we did. We got through our poems, we got through the Telltale Heart, Alone, the Conqueror Worm, Spirits of the Dead, Annabelle Lee, and the Raven. So, I believe that is where we are going to be ending for the night. Oh, and not the big boss, uh, you'll be fine. I'm going to be clipping, or I'm going to be editing out um, all of the poems. I'm going to take all the pieces and I will make a small YouTube video uh, for them. So if you're ever interested, I will try to get that out within the next couple of days. It will be on the YouTubes, on my YouTube channel, which you can find down below in either one of the links or in my link tree. Ahaha, <laughs> shameless self plug. You used over 8k. Heck yeah, you did it with style. Now, hmm. Where do we take us to? Yes, Blue, obviously, should be going to that YouTube channel 
and subscribing and smashing that notification bell, naturally. I do also have a VOD channel. It's also in the link tree. So if you ever miss anything and want to go and rewatch it for whatever crazy reason, you can find it there as well. And yes, I believe we're going to go ahead and raid. Yeah. Hmm. I think we're going to raid Pandemonium. Because that's just... You know, that's just how we do around here. Yeah, like, comment, and subscribe. All the good things. I don't expect that YouTube channel to ever get much traction, but I still try to make content for it from time to time. But we are going to go ahead and raid Pandemonium. Raid F. <laughs> Dislike, unsubscribe, unfollow. You know, Chocolate Disco... Sometimes you just got to do what your heart tells you to, and I understand that. So, uh, on Tuesday, we are going to do more uh, Dead Space. On Thursday, I don't know yet. On And on Saturday, we are going to be reading some stories from the wonderful, wonderful Lovecraft. So... Thank you guys so much for sticking around. I super appreciate it. I know I can fumble a bit and have some difficulties with weeding sometimes, but I do appreciate you guys taking the time to stick around during that. So, to say my outro really quickly, thank you very much for coming by, whether you were wa watching, whether you were chatting, whether you were lurking, whether you were just in and out for just a moment. Know that you are incredibly appreciated. I hope that you're having a great day, afternoon, evening, or night, whatever time it might happen to be for you. I hope that you're taking care of yourselves. I hope that you're drinking plenty of water. And when you finally do sleep, whatever time that might happen to be for you, I hope that you have a very restful sleep. I will see you guys over in Pom Pom, in, in, Pom -pom, in Pandemonium's channel. I will see you guys then, and I will see you guys very soon. <laughs>